versus fragmentation, we have a multi-layered and many siloed discipline. This is partly a consequence of uh, the archaeological tendency to specialism um, and partly a result of the systems that we have adapted or have been put upon us for doing archaeology. This in turn has led to this in turn, sorry, I'm, I'm, I've just I'm hesitated slightly because there's a massive lag, so I'm sort of watching and, and doing something. So I apologise, this hesitation, I'm going to wave my arms about so I know where, how long the lag is. Um, why do I keep hearing things? <laughs> right. um, this is in turn has led to a lack of clear thinking about... Um, this in turn has led to a lack of um, clear thinking about systemic uh, succession planning. What, more, what about archaeological archives? Who are the next generations of fine specialists? Um, and even more basically, what about a universally agreed system of standards for actually doing archaeology there? My hands are waved on the screen, so that's a little delay. There is a loss of expertise, or a potential loss of expertise, in certain core areas of archaeological endeavour. We have failed to address all of these things and more, and this has led to the third issue, which is to say the lack of a coherent archaeological voice. This means we haven't been sufficiently upstream of many of the processes which affect archaeology. So, fragmentation. Archaeology can be characterised as a biosphere of several ecosystems which have different degrees of action and interaction. Some of you may have seen my diagram before. In this diagram, the coloured circles show the relative size of the different ecosystems, and the arrows show the day-to-day -day flow of information and communications. The thicker the arrows, the more communication. The scale and influence of the different ecosystems is highly varied. Links between them are also inconsistent. Uh, some take more, some give more. Most archaeology is conducted by the two ecosystems at the bottom, regulators and practitioners. And there is a tendency for CIFA members and conversations like this at CIFA conferences to focus on this. But as Esther pointed out, we are part of a much wider biosphere of heritage and heritage protection as well. We fail to engage with museums and conservation and even the gilet clad practitioners of historic building preservation at our peril. Nevertheless, we are here at uh, CIFA conference, and so let's focus on those two ecosystems of regulators and practitioners, which, rightly or wrongly, make up the bulk of CIFA members. These two ecosystems are unequal in power, influence, and in their relationship to the public. Regulators are actual public servants paid for through, paid for through general taxation. Some of them are directly answerable to elected members, in other words, local politicians. Practitioners are private organisations, some set up as charities, so there is a degree of public accountability. They must deliver public benefit as defined by charity law, which is not the same as public engagement with archaeology as many people here might think of it. Curiously, most archaeological companies, which are also charities, do so-called commercial archaeology as part of their primary purpose trading, not through a trading subsidiary. This is another interesting area of discussion that I don't have time for today. On paper, this is how a social contract model of society should operate. A strong and dynamic private sector providing innovative and creative solutions with strong and transparent regulation from the public sector or its proxies. However, there are two key issues limiting the effectiveness of this system as it relates to archaeology. The first is that these systems are reactive in the moment. There are very limited regulatory levers to ensure that long-term outcomes are achieved, such as archiving, publication and synthesis. The second is that archaeology does not fit well into commercial procurement models, and I'm pleased that Michael's initiative will hopefully overcome some of those issues. And the market, this is the big issue, the market, so-called market for archaeological services, remains firmly driven by price rather than quality. And Jan Wills who spoke earlier, uh, did a report a couple of years ago which showed that very clearly. And I'm going to uh, illustrate this by way of an analogy, and here I show you the beauty that is Sutton Junction Signal Box, which is part of the um, railway network at Shrewsbury, which is a significant and important railway junction. This is just south of Shrewsbury main station. The infrastructure here is essentially Victorian, and this signal box is one of four that together comprise the largest mechanical signal system still in operation in the world. 
Now, this infrastructure is run and maintained by a public body. And here you see four men in orange who are maintaining that, and they're public. They're paid by the public purse directly. They are public body. The trains that run along it, on the other hand, are ostensibly uh, managed and run by private bodies. But in practice, this system has always been hugely subsidised. And in the last few years, many train operators have begun to be brought back into public management. And the train, shown here, is now owned by a French, UK, Canadian consortium, which is effectively managed by the Welsh Government as part of an increasingly self-confident and integrated Transport for Wales portfolio and approach. Now, I could go into the reason why Shrewsbury is a significant part of the Welsh railway network, um, despite not being in Wales, but I, I won't. Um, uh, anyway, it, it is, uh, for reasons that are wrong. The privatisation of the railways, however, was never really about improving efficiency, it was about creating wealth for shareholders. And public opinion has shifted, and polling now consistently shows widespread support for public ownership of the railways. But, but, the train shown here, the actual rolling stock, was built in 1991 in Derby by British Rail Engineering Limited, which was a publicly owned company that invested in training, apprenticeships, and in building expertise across several generations of railway engineers. This British Railway Engineering was privatised in the 1990s and essentially asset stripped, and this country now lacks the skills, the engineering skills base, to build new trains. And as a result, the replacements for this train are being built in Spain and in Switzerland. So this neatly brings me on to the question of changing expertise. Others have spoken, spoken far more eloquently than me about the loss of skills, and I think we're on the cusp of a generational shift uh, where we are losing or about to lose expertise in pottery analysis and identification, and also in some of the scientific disciplines. On the other side of the coin, there are also new skills that we need to invest in. And I don't really mean technical skills, although these are important. There are other skills, for example, we have consistently undervalued community archaeology as a distinct strand of archaeological endeavour and expertise. It's great to see the new skills matrix produced by the C for Voluntary and Community Action Group. Kate talked just before the break about having the confidence to engage in discussion with those creating regulation of the frameworks, and that confidence comes from having expertise and from building expertise in the sector. Incidentally, I agree with the comment that was made earlier about the problematic nature of the term commercial archaeology, which is why I prefer to talk about archaeological practice. And this separation also fails to bring into the conversation other areas of archaeological practice, such as community archaeology, which I already mentioned, as well as heritage management, agri-environment work, and non-field-based archaeological activity. Not all archaeologists take hold, and I think that's something that still CIFA fails to recognise, not perhaps institutionally, but a large core its member. As a result of this, archaeological outcomes are often less than optimal. Archaeologists need to be empowered to see themselves as research scientists for the public good, rather than merely as adjuncts to the construction industry and its finances. Having said that, we need to be able to tell stories that engage people, as Kate Clark emphasised in her keynote, and as others like Mark Spanier have consistently argued for many years. Of course, telling stories takes many forms. And entertaining, though Pete's introduction was, it was hardly an example of accessible language for the TikTok generation. <laughs> and the same is true of our own data. This is a screenshot from Archwilio, which is the historic environment record of the four Welsh archaeological trusts. Uniquely, the whole of Wales is covered by this single public online portal, which, and uniquely also, the HER in Wales is a statutory obligation for Welsh Government to deliver. The HR is statutory in the UK, it is in Wales, hurrah. Now, red dots are core records, green dots are events. Now, you can click on most events and it brings up the grey literature report. So, it's accessible, it's public, you know, stories in it. But I want to make two points here, and the first is about the content of these reports themselves. Um, these are technical reports, reports which discuss the joy of different soil colours and sections and post holes. And there was some discussion the other day about how important that is. Um, but individually, I have very little to say about the wider landscape within which they are situated. And quite often, this is it. This is an inevitable consequence, of course, of a site specific focus that is led by development and planning pressures. There is no incentive and no encouragement to develop synthesis. This is left to individual enthusiasm and occasionally some publicly funded research. 
And then I'll select some examples of research project which have delivered synthesis, very means your thoughts and other subject can be tackled. But whilst all these are drawn from development, have drawn from development driven archaeology, they're always engaged with it as well as they might. And maybe Michael's project will build capacity, build resources within the sector to enable more synthesis to take place. But because we can't um, tell these wider stories, we can't always engage with the wider population, and this means politicians, and of course it also means voters. There are also huge gaps in coverage, and this brings me to my second point, and this is Pembroke, one of the most important places in medieval Wales, an Anglo-Norman planned town, which was central to the narrative of English colonial conquest and exploitation of the Welsh people, and indeed was a springboard for that same English colonial conquest in the 12th, 13th century of Ireland. And it is therefore central to the narrative of, of where we are today in these, in these confused and beleaguered <coughs> islands. However, compared to South East England, the relative lack of prosperity and the resulting lack of development means that there's been a real lack of development-driven archaeology, especially in the medieval town. And this really limits the stories we can draw out. So, Whilst private sector development driven archaeology might deliver public benefit in South East England uh, or in large infrastructure projects, it fails to do so in other parts of the UK where the pace of development is slower. And of course, just on a point, large scale infrastructure projects, all large scale infrastructure projects, like our railway network, are actually publicly funded, even though there might be some sort of consortium of multinational people who are digging holes and pouring concrete and trying to look glamorous and hide his vests. Um, in fact, they're publicly funded pieces of work, and often they have quite generous pieces of, of, of public archaeology because of that, um, or as part of that. Um, and these are exceptions, though, however, and although it's marvellous to hear about the work that's done with them, they are exceptional. And of course, they include HS2, which, for all its positive benefits, annoyingly counts towards Welsh government expenditure, even though it has no impact outside of southern England. But I digress. Anyway, <laughs> by focusing on development as a pressure on archaeology, we haven't always engaged with some of the other pressures, and we perhaps limit our capacity to do so. So I'll just show you here, um, this is Dina Stinsle in on the west coast of Wales, beautiful hill fort, uh, eroding into the sea. And climate change is one such pressure and a real challenge. And as many people have said this week, archaeology can inform society about past climate change and can also help mitigate some of the effects of future climate change. There are other agendas to which we can contribute as well. We can and should grapple with questions of economic well-being, accessibility, social inclusion, and above all, mental and physical well-being. But we can't do this when we're solely focused on delivering public benefit for developers. So how do we get over these gaps? There we go, the symbolic bridge photograph. No doubt we'll recognise this bridge, which is at Chepstow. Chepstow is about half an hour's drive from where you are in Bath. And if you want to see the contrast between economic and archaeological prosperity represented by Bath and the relative poverty of other parts of the UK, then go to Chepstow and look at the boarded up charity shops. The real significance of this bridge uh, for this talk, though, is that this photograph was taken in Wales, and on the other side of the bridge is England. And I make no apology for speaking from a Welsh perspective, and often in frustration at the profoundly Anglo-centric discourse about these matters in CIFA. And yet perhaps the bridge, indeed the solution to some of these issues, can be found on the Welsh side of the border. Because for nearly 50 years, a regionally based system has delivered a mixture of public service and private innovation whilst maintaining skills and to some extent managing to overcome issues of continuity and resilience. And the Welsh Archaeological Trust have proved remarkably resilient. Uh, they have outlived the creation and abolition of different forms of government. They have outlived whole swathes of historic environment and planning legislation and indeed outlived many of the structures within archaeology itself. The Welsh Archaeological Trust are charities whose only object is education. They deliver a whole range of public services that elsewhere are part of by the state, either local or national government, HDR, planning advice, heritage management, and so on. They're also at the cutting edge of commercial research. And of course, this system is reliant on public funding. About 40% of funding for the Welsh Archaeological Trust comes from either Welsh government or local authorities. I'm very proud of our role in delivering a public service. And we're very conscious of our our charitable status gives us flexibility, which public bodies lack, but also security and a long-term focus, which private sector organisations can dream of. 
Now, of course, we are vulnerable to diminutions of public funding, and there's been a lot of head-scratching recently about how we might carry this journey forward over the next 10, 20, 50 years. And, of course, the system in Wales is not perfect. There are ways in which the Welsh Archaeological Trust could work more closely together and harmonise, for example, responses to development pressures. Nevertheless, the system has proved able to maintain regional expertise, has remained largely consistent and stable, and has been resilient in the face of massive change since the mid 1970s. It's a model that should be borne in mind when the sector is talking more widely about overcoming some of the fragmentation that I talked about earlier. So I think we need not be afraid to break down the systemic boundaries and argue for real change to the system if we are serious about delivering public benefit. And if we're serious about delivering public benefit, we need to move beyond the free market paradigm. This isn't a free market, it's a failed market. And market forces are not the solution to the problems that archaeology faces. These are the people we serve, and we need to focus more on our public. Archaeologists and the institutions we purport to represent them can and should make a case for more public funding and a more considered approach to archaeological practice, challenging existing methods and vested interests. Thank you.